Willkommen, meine Freunde, to another week in the city by the Chocolate Milk River, and what a week it was. It's from the year that bought us President Reagan, the Audi Quattro, and I met the first girl who ever broke my heart. Twice. And the week in question is the week ending August 25, 1980. At number 10, we have the one and only entry on the charts from the pre eurythmics Annie Lennox and Dave Stewart with The Tourists and their version of I Only Want to Be With You. While this is not the greatest version of the song ever, it's quirky and interesting and very 1980. It's prescient because Annie Lennox is one of the few British singers who can credibly claim to be a successor to the great, 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 great Dusty Springfield, whom by now we have established to be imperious and inimitable. Even though she's far from the finished product here, there are still traces of her Aberdeen burr and she looks singularly uncomfortable in front of the camera, but few major artists have ever presented a convincing prehistory as she. Number 9 sees the final single from Michael Jackson's excellent and all-conquering Off The Wall album. She's out of my life, still refusing to waver, climbing up a spot on its epic stay without ever making number one. It's not the greatest thing MJ ever did, if anything it's a bit overwrought and silly, but proving he could do it all was MJ's manifesto from the moment he hooked up with Quincy Jones, and if singing Big Balance was part of us, who are we to argue with his Michaelness? Our number eight this week is one of the men Elton John took his name from, apparently, Long John Baldry of the bluesy rumbling voice and Kathy MacDonald of the Dulles Dishwater Mall singer voice and their version of the Righteous Brothers hit You've Lost That Love and Feeling. It's not great, it's not awful, but a lot of people bought it, sending it to number one in late July, making it the 777th biggest chart hit of the physical era in my own hometown, besting by a single place the Beatles' ticket to ride. Lucky number seven is a somewhat less tenuously Beatle connected song in John Farnham's See He Isn't Johnny Anymore version of Help. The fact that Farnham had gone almost seven years without a top 40 hit is staggering given his previous ubiquity and unimpeachable status. It wasn't for want of trying, anyone my age and interested in such things will remember his increasingly sad efforts to stay in the public eye. An unfunny sitcom, backed up by tax problems and relegation to the cabaret circus, culminating in a particularly embarrassing appearance on a high-rating Saturday night variety show, his face caked with glitter makeup, but his saturnine expression making him look like the most wretched of Pagliacci's. But Farnham had two things going for him. A voice that sadness had taught him how to sing with, and the fact that he was a good fellow who made loyal friends. And those loyal friends included Glenn Wheatley, the manager of the then Red Hot in the USA Little River Band, who took over his management in 1980, resulting in a more AOR style of help. A spell as a lead vocalist of Little River Band and his 10 years of chart domination from 1986 onwards. It's a funny thing here in Australia. Everyone from 18 to 80 loves John Farnham, whether they know his songs particularly or not. He's an authoritative and consummate entertainer. He is, despite all of the hardships mid-career, grounded, gracious and friendly. And he has a sense of humour. His perpetual cycle of retirements and comebacks is both a national joke and delight that he himself finds amusing. And it all began, again, with this record. At number six, it's the village people making their way to number one. The record was going at this time down the national chart, having had four weeks at number one on the Kent Report chart, even before it made our local top ten. With the stomping, can't stop the music. Soundtrack to a truly terrible movie. This was the last big hit the VPs had before they updated their image to that of New Romantics, without fully understanding who the New Romantics were. It's time to feel the first furtive forficulations of some flambuginous filly loo as we plunge into Fowl's fantastic world of facts for this week. The biggest rise of this week was Xanadu by Olivia Newton-John, which leapt 41 places from number 70 to number 29. The biggest riser within the top 20, however, was My Own Private Idaho by the B-52s, up 11 places to number 25. On the flip side, the biggest faller was New Zealand's Kim Hart, with the not exactly bad Love at First Night. Hart was obviously being positioned as the next Christy Allen, but this was to be her only top 40 hit, falling this week from 16 to 23. 
The highest debuting band with New Yorkers Spider with New Romance, a pretty good pop new wave type song let down badly by a poor vocalist. It sounds for all the world like a demo for a Pat Benatar song, just waiting to lose the guide vocals and have PB wail over the top. And the longest runner on the charts this week were the Spinners with their fun version of Working My Way Back To You, which had held out for 21 weeks and made it as high as number 12. In the USA, Olivia Newton-John held the nation bewitched with magic from the frankly bonkers musical Xanadu. And in England, David Bowie swept all before him with ashes to ashes. Now, there's a guy who knew what New Romantic meant. Number one album in the land, as it had been for five weeks previous, was a soundtrack to the aforementioned bonkers roller disco meets erotic Greek myth Xanadu. Back on the track, back at number 5. Why is it that number 5 seems so often to be the weak link in the top 40? Here we have a former number 1 with Mac Davis's It's Hard To Be Humble, a cheap country novelty song that reflects badly on Davis who had an otherwise sterling pedigree as a songwriter, penning In The Ghetto and A Little Less Conversation amongst others for Elvis, I Believe In Music for Gallery and he himself had a big hit with Baby Don't Get Hooked On Me. A good looking chap, he was also a successful actor and even hosted an episode of The Muppet Show. It's Rocky Burnett with Fallen In Love, his follow-up to his number one hit, Tied a Toe in the Line. It's a much more pop-angled record and it didn't fare nearly as well and that was all we heard of him. Rocky was of course son of the great rockabillyist Johnny Burnett, who recorded the original and most demented version of the rockabilly standard, Train Kept a Rollin'. Number three is the US number one Magic by Olivia Newton-John. A curious thing about this record is that its follow-up single Xanadu actually rose up the charts so quickly that it leapfrogged it while it was still in the top three but it choked at number two. Still in 1980 it was pretty much indisputable that Livy was the biggest female act in the world and then she released Physical in 1981 and the female part of that label became redundant. Number two is the fun and rockin' What I Like About You by The Romantics, which after 30 years of lurking on 80s greatest one-hit wonders compilation CDs, even though they had two hits, now seems to appear in almost every movie, TV ad and trailer drop under the sun. A prime slice of power pop from what, for some, might have been the end of the line for a golden decade of Detroit rockers, it remains one of the best songs ever to stall at number two. An anecdote, the next year as we trooped out of high school, all my friends used the money from the jobs they'd been working in the last two years to buy cars. I didn't, I used it to buy a pro quality guitar. I wanted a Telecaster because that's what Steve Cropper played, but I remember how cool that guy in the Romantics looked with his black and white Rickenbacker, so I bought one of those. It was ludicrously expensive. It was also the worst guitar I ever owned. At least I got my money back when I sold it on six months later. And what, you may well ask, dear viewer, is the number one hit in the city that was the jewel of Australia's police state? All will be revealed at the appropriate juncture, in due course, in the fullness of time. But not until Gene has flipped his wig on the tub, so flip that wig, Gene. After such a good, solid collection for the top 10, it's always a bit of a letdown to find slightly worthless and unmemorable fluff tying down the top spot. I barely remember this song, to tell the truth. It's a four-square solid disco thump, but even as a last cannonade of the disco sound, it ain't such a much. And so ends the week. A poor number one, plenty of great music on the chart otherwise. Change was in the air. Disco was finally on its way out, off to become house music, and the new waivers were beginning to impose themselves on the chart. I hope that when we next address the countdown that makes you get down, we can meet again in such similar wondrous fields. The fields of the past, which is indeed a foreign country.